All right, welcome and thank you for joining us for today's event, a follow-up discussion on commercial real estate in the wake of COVID-19. My name is Gabe Bolio and I'm a member of the Career Programs team here in the Office of Alumni Relations. Today's webinar is sponsored by the Boston University Alumni Association and is offered to our 346,000 alumni around the globe. Before we begin, I'd like to welcome the many members of our BU community who are tuning in today from places like Pune and Mumbai, to San Mateo, Pasadena, Los Angeles, Portland, Phoenix, Austin, and New Orleans, Hoover, Alabama, Wellington, Florida, Durham, North Carolina, and spots like Vienna, Virginia, Lancaster, PA, Inglewood, New Jersey, as well as across New York State from Pittsburgh to White Plains and Manhattan to Melville. Also, hello to our, uh, our listeners tuning in from New England in spots like Norwalk and Danbury, Bow, Bedford, and Hampton, New Hampshire, Shelburne, Vermont, and across Massachusetts from Swampscott to Situate, Stoughton to Sudsbury, and many spots in between. We're glad to welcome you all here today. Today's presentation is being recorded and will soon be available for on-demand viewing on the Alumni Association website. If you have questions for our speakers today, you can submit them throughout the presentation by typing them in the Q&A box. To find the Q&A box, mouse over your Zoom screen to reveal the toolbar at the bottom, then select Q&A. It is now my pleasure to introduce our moderator for today's program, Rick Rostoff. Rick is Vice President of Acquisitions at Linear Retail Properties. He joined Linear in December of 2014. Rick is responsible for sourcing and closing retail acquisitions in Eastern Massachusetts, Southern New Hampshire, Rhode Island, and Southern Maine. Since joining Linear, Rick has participated in the acquisition of approximately 20 retail properties with an aggregate value of over $200 million. Prior to joining Linear, he founded and operated Spectra Realty Associates, where he participated in the brokerage and development of over $250 million in retail, hotel, and office properties. At Spectra, Rick represented some of New England's largest commercial real estate developers and owners, as well as numerous retail and hotel REITs. He also participated in the development of some of the largest retail and multifamily properties throughout New England. Rick is an active supporter of the Lynn Boys and Girls Club, the Greater Boston Food Bank, and the Daner Faber Cancer Institute. He's also an active alumnus of Brandeis University, and of course, BU, where he's really the architect of these wonderful discussions. Rick, thank you for all that you do for BU and for the Real Estate Network. And now I turn the floor over to you. Thank you very much for that introduction, Gabe. Um, so I'm gonna start off by introducing our panel. But before that, I'm going to uh, give a quick shout out to Keith Munsell. Uh, Keith um, is a professor and he runs the real estate program at Boston University. Um, I'm not sure if everyone on this panel has had him as a teacher. Uh, but he's been teaching there for over 30 years and has taught hundreds, if not thousands of people in the uh, Boston and New England commercial real estate market. So get a, give a good shout out to Keith, who's actually in class right now. Um, so now the rest of our panel, I'm going to start out with David Lusky. Uh, David is president and co-founder of DRA Advisors. Um, they're based out of New York City. DRA is a diversified real estate investment company with about $11.5 billion in real estate assets under management. Uh, DRA has holdings in multifamily, retail, office, and industrial assets throughout the country. Um, then we also have Sandy Silk. Sandy is Senior Vice President and Development Partner uh, for Jefferson Apartment Group. Jefferson Apartment Group operates about 10,000 residential units throughout the East Coast with another 2,500 units under development. Currently, Sandy leads the development of J. Malden Center. That's a uh, 500,000 square foot mixed use development in Malden, Mass, um, which just came online during the pandemic. So it'll be interesting to hear about that. Um, Sandy's been involved in the development and construction of approximately 1,500 residential units in the greater Boston area. Um, we also have Josh Weinprince with us. Josh is president, Kimco Realty, Northern Region. Uh, Kimco owns and operates 400 shopping centers throughout the United States, encompassing over 70 million square feet of retail space, including two shopping centers within a half mile of my house. So I'm using one of them every single day. 
Um, his company's valuation as of Monday was $4.8 billion, but his uh, stock went up, I believe, about 30% this week. So he's uh, even more than that. Uh, we also have Carla Moynihan. Carla Moynihan is a uh, attorney with partner at Sharon and Lodgin in Boston. She represents owners, lenders, investors, developers, tenants, et cetera, doing acquisitions, dispositions, leasing and financing. And she also teaches at the Boston University School of Law. And we also have John Conley. John is a principal at CB Equities. Uh, for most of his career, John was involved in office and industrial properties. Um, previous to CB Equities, he worked for some such acclaimed firms as Glenborough Realty Trust, Goldman Sachs, and Equity Office Properties. John is currently involved with development and ownership of various commercial and residential properties around New England. So the format is going to be, I'm just going to go through and ask each panelist a few questions. Um, we'll let them answer. Um, then we'll also be fielding your questions during the uh, broadcast. Um, and then I'll ask some open questions to the panel and uh, things should go great. So we're gonna start off with Sandy Silk. Um, Sandy had also joined us in a webinar we did around April during the start of the pandemic. So Sandy, um, how have the performance of your properties changed from the beginning of the pandemic to now? And has one type of your properties performed better than others, such as urban versus suburban or higher end versus more moderate? Um, happy to answer the question. First of all, thank you so much, um, Rick and Gabe, for inviting me to be a part of this panel um, and to my fellow panelists for sharing this experience. Um, relative to kind of where we were at the beginning of the pandemic, um, I, we were way back in March and April, nobody really knew what was gonna happen. Um, it was still a little early. Um, most of our portfolio is in um, more affluent markets, generally speaking, and, and more in the kind of A tier of, of property class relative to um, multifamily assets. And so what we found at the outset was we had some people approaching us for rent relief, but it wasn't vast numbers of, of um, residents. Um, and it was actually driven more in general from a point of fear than it was from a point of reality because it was too early. Not, not that many of our residents are truly in the service industries or hospitality and some of those, the industries that have been heavily affected. Um, more of our residents honestly were um, upset when with the closing of the amenity spaces and asking um, when those spaces were coming back on line and uh, some folks would actually ask, you know, could they get rent reduced because the, they didn't have access to all of the property's amenities. Um, as time went on, the delinquency um, profile changed. Um, and I would say that generally speaking, our best performing assets have been those that are more suburban in nature, as opposed to the ones that are um, uh, more urban. So we own an, an asset in Longwood that uh, is an, was an existing asset that we purchased about a year and a half ago. Um, and that asset due, the, due to a heavy student, graduate student population um, has been hit actually pretty hard. Um, and we've been very aggressive there with um, rent reductions um, and actually really concessions on bringing uh, people back. Um, the other piece of that particular property um, in the Boston market is that that property had a lot of international residents. Uh, so we had people who would pay their rent and they had left um, because school was remote uh, and they basically were not renewing. Um, so that's, that's one piece of the story. Uh, across our portfolio, um, one of our best performing assets was right on the main line, right outside of Philadelphia, super affluent community, a high, a high um, mix of empty nesters and established professionals. And there was very little rent delinquency there and very little turnover because those folks still had their jobs, still had their income. Um, half of them decamped to um, second homes um, that they had anyways. So, so that profile is different. Now, fast forward to today, right? And, um, and the scenario is really different. Um, if anybody's been in the multifamily market, concessions are, are really deep. Um, we're seeing three months concessions in certain markets. Um, we've actually been running rent specials where, you know, for a, kind of a fifth, 
rent equivalent of a flash sale. Um, we did one this weekend um, up in Malden where you got $300 off a month um, if you rented by, by Sunday. Um, that actually drove a significant number of leases, 10 leases in a week in a project that has been very well received, but is having a slower than normal lease up due to the pandemic. Um, and we're seeing that across, across the board from our competitors as well, that leasing properties and lease up have a need to get the properties filled. And the strategy has really been, how do we get residents in? We, we're not really expecting those residents to renew, but we wanna get that, that particular unit into kind of the next part of the cycle. And that's a pretty important um, metric. Okay. Did I get yeah. all of the points of your question? You did. Now, how about, um, we know that the federal government has not put out another stimulus plan and people in all walks of life are some, you know, hurting at their jobs. Do you have fear over the winter that if another stimulus plan isn't put out that things might get even worse with some tenants? Uh, that's definitely the case, right? Um, again, I think based on the quality of the assets that we own, um, we're, the stimulus package isn't a huge driver for at, at the A level um, and B plus level of asset. As you go further down um, in asset quality or age, um, or you know, kind of older assets, it definitely becomes a, a real factor. So you know, the the Commonwealth and um, has issued a, a essentially a moratorium on evictions on the residential side, uh, and that is. You know that that has not affected us as dramatically as it has some of our um, our, our colleagues uh, who have diff a more varied asset base. Okay, great. Thanks for your input. Um, we're going to move on to David Lusky now. Um, David, I know that your firm owns a variety of asset classes. Uh, we're just wondering during this pandemic, uh, which asset classes for you have performed the best, and which have performed uh, the worst. First of all, thanks again to uh, Gabe and Rick to uh, having us be part of this panel. And to jump into your question, you know, what you read in the media a lot about is the industrial market has been very strong and the multifamily markets have been very strong. And I would say both of those have been kind of the leaders in our portfolio. Uh, in addition, the office portfolio is pretty steady in the sense that most of our tenants are typically longer lease committed to the project. So from that perspective, you know, there's a lot of stability, but there hasn't been a lot of new leasing activity, obviously in the last three to six months. You know, our portfolio probably that suffered the hardest was the retail sector and that, you know, retail, as we all know, if you can't get out of your house to go shop, it's gonna be a problem. And so Fortunately, we own about 100 shopping centers and 90 of them are grocer anchored shopping centers with drugstores and banks and kind of some of the essential services that had to stay open, whether it's a Home Depot or a Walmart or a Target. And so those have actually fared pretty well. But the small tenant that, you know, sits alongside the anchor boxes clearly has been impacted, whether they're in a uh, service business, whether it's a salon or a restaurant. And so, you know, we have had, you know, we have over 4,000 tenants in our portfolio. I can tell you 1,200 of them reached out for some type of assistance. Most of them, we gave a deferment package where we would help them in the initial couple months to kind of not have to pay rent today and push it out to a further year and try to extend their lease or something, kind of get a benefit out of it. But the reality is that, you know, the anchor tenants and the credit tenants that are in the markets have done pretty well. But I think this whole pandemic has accelerated what was already a very weak sector, which was retail. And, you know, you've seen a lot of bankruptcies across the board, especially in the apparel industry. And so fortunately, we're not in the mall business because that's a totally different sector that has experienced you know, a lot of pain. And then in addition, we're also not in the hospitality se sector where, you know, many of the hotels have been shut down across the country. Okay. And um, have certain regions of the country, be it for office or retail, um, in your eyes have done better than the others? I mean, we, we are predominantly a 
suburban and secondary market player because we are a value added manager. So even though we do have some assets that are in CBD markets, so, you know, like a Chicago or a Minneapolis, um, the, the areas that got hit the hardest in those were not necessarily the office buildings themselves, but the street level retail that was underneath. So if a building had, you know, a restaurant or whatever it might be, a service type tenant, you know, a lot of those have been shut down, you know, one for the pandemic, two for rioting and damage, and third for, you know, the recent election that has come up where people were anticipating that, you know, the damage would come again. And so there was kind of a forced shutdown, even though we really didn't need it. And so I would say the suburban markets have done pretty well. There's been a, you know, we all read about in the newspaper a pretty large exodus of people out of New York. We're based in New York, moving out of the city. Um, I would say a little bit of that is hyped up in the sense that it's probably the top tier of the market, because if you walk most of the submarkets around the city, there are plenty of residents that are still here, but the commercial space and the occupants of those buildings is really what's been the downfall in that, you know, today I think maybe 10 to 15% of the office space that's actually in the city is being occupied by tenants, even though 90% of it is, you know, occupied and paying rent. Are the more substantial, significant restaurants, you know, around, Manhattan, have most of them stayed open to you, to your knowledge, or have they been, you know, some closing for good or some temporary closing? Yeah, I think it's a mixed bag across the board. I mean, if if it's if a restaurant had a little bit of landlord assistance or the wherewithal to stay open, you know, they've pivoted to, you know, delivery, outdoor dining, and I think that's been a real plus for New York City, but now as we get into November and the weather is slowly getting cold, um, you're finding that, you know, many of those restaurants are trying to figure out, you know, how are we going to operate in the depths of the winter? I mean, the city has allowed for the outdoor dining to continue through next year, even though originally it was only through the fall of this year. And so the right to be able to put, you know, tables and chairs, not only on the sidewalk, but actually in the street where the parking is, has been, you know, something very unusual. Now they're trying to figure out, you know, how they're going to do that with enclosing the, the space as well as providing, you know, heated space and still complying with, you know, the CDC type of regulations on or recommendations as to, you know, air quality, et cetera. So, it's it's sad in that, you know, many restaurants that were very famous have had to close, but, you know, quite a few have continued to be open. And the reality will be that hopefully there'll be a reset as this comes out, you know, in the back end of this pandemic. And, you know, many new ones will open up again. Great. All right. While we're in the state of New York, we'll move to Josh, um, who's on Long Island, not in the city, but same general area. So Josh, um, same question I asked to Sandy. How have you seen the uh, uh, performance of your property change from the beginning of the pandemic uh, through now? All right, great. Well, thanks, Rick and Gabe, for having me. And um, much like Sandy and David said, you know, it's really a, a cycle that we've seen. Um, back in you know March and April, you know, really was the depths of. Um, at least for us in, in my area in New York, where we saw kind of the trough of both physical, um, you know, occupancy in terms of people operating their stores and rent collections. And since then, it's kind of turned around and it's been slowly working its way back up. Um, back in April, you know, in terms of physical tenants being open in our portfolio, we hit a low of about 55%. So, you know, that was, you know, normally a typical run rate is close to 100% occupied and open. Um, this was 55% of the tenants were open back in April. Um, now we've slowly worked that back up. We're about now at 95% open and operating. And those are tenants that are either fully open or partially open doing takeout and, and delivery and stuff like that, but still being able to operate and thus pay rent. Um, in terms of the rent side of the equation, back in April, you know, we got hit pretty hard and we were only collecting about 60% of the rent 
back in April and May of this year. Um, as the virus worked its way through many of our markets and we were able to open back up, we saw those rent collections come back to not quite where they were, you know, in a normal year, um, but they're now back to about 90%. So this last month we collected 90% of our rent where back in January before the pandemic, you know, we'd be at about 98% collected. So we're still, we're still off the, you know, the normal run rate, but we're getting back to where we were. Hopefully um, things don't get worse and we can maintain where we are and continue to chip away at it and get, get back to, um, you know, where we were pre-pandemic. Uh, obviously, if things turn the other way and, and some municipalities force uh, businesses to close again, we'll probably see it go the opposite way for a while. And, and hopefully we can help tenants, um, you know, sustain themselves through that period of time so that when everything gets back to normal, they'll be able to reopen and operate. Have uh, one type of your properties feared better during the downturn it depends on location or suburban versus urban or grocery anchored versus non-grocery anchored? Um, you know, most of our properties are suburban um, assets in top markets. So I wouldn't say we saw a big difference between locations. It was really more about the tenants that you had in your assets. So, you know, the grocery anchored centers, the centers where we had, you know, home improvement, um, Furniture, discount retailers, you know, Target, Walmart, all of those guys did fairly well. Um, those, those centers saw an increase in traffic and the periphery tenants around them did better than other centers where we didn't have those types of uses as anchors. So where we had centers on the flip side that were anchored by, um, you know, gyms, um, other types of users that were shut down, those service users around those anchors really suffered. Um, across the board, you know, sit down restaurants have had a tough time as you guys talked about earlier. Um, a lot of service users like dry cleaners and, um, you know, these other types of businesses that just the business evaporated have had a really tough time. And so we've been working very closely with a lot of them, whether it be, uh, rent deferrals or abatements or putting tenants on percentage rent and a variety of different programs to really help them, you know, bridge the gap to the other side of when the business returns. Now, I know you have some properties under development. Um, has the pandemic slowed them down at all or have they opened up and how have they fared? Uh, well, our largest development project that we're working on now is in Staten Island, New York. It's a 450,000 square foot um, redevelopment of a shopping center, it's predominantly retail. And in the middle of the pandemic, when everything was forced to close down, we were able to get a essential use designation for our anchor, which was a ShopRite grocery store. So we were able to continue the construction on the grocer who opened about a month ago, while the other tenants we had to stop because those were deemed non-essential. So we had tenants like Ulta and Marshalls and PetSmart uh, we had an LA Fitness, um, all of these, some restaurants, all were under construction and those had to, had to pause, but the grocer we were able to continue and they opened. So they opened up very strong about a month ago and the construction has continued on the other retail, which is now gonna open in the spring. So did you have to restructure some of your lease commitments? You know, cause I know in retail, there's certain guidelines put in as to, you know, when, uh, the actual occupancy starts versus rent commencement starts. So did that change? We, we for, for that project, we didn't have to really restructure anything because most of the deals were still, even though we pushed them out um, because we were delayed, they were still within the window of our delivery dates. So, you know, there were a handful where we had some penalties where we will incur penalties for late delivery, but the deals are still intact. And there are other tenants that are still within those windows. So, you know, a couple of months delay didn't really have a material impact on the project. Interesting. Okay. Well, thanks very much, Josh. Now we're going to move to John Conley. Um, John, I know that for years you've been in the uh, office uh, market uh, place. Um, so 
you know, from what I've heard, there's a big discrepancy between what's actually occupied uh, versus what's leased in downtown office buildings. What have you heard in terms of that? Sure, yeah, thanks for having me, Rick and Gabe. I know this was uh, a lot of work to put together, so I appreciate it. I also appreciate the other panelists. You guys are teaching me some stuff too, so thanks very much. Um, yeah, Rick, it's in, I was gonna talk about sort of two things that are going on in the market now, one on the leasing front and the second one on the uh, investment sales front. So on the, on, the, on the occupancy, as you mentioned, you know, uh, we had one of the greatest economies of all time leading up into this. So for the most part, office space was, you know, 90 plus percent leased going into this. Um, and then a lot, of, um, a lot of the deals were done in the last couple of years. So they, they all have term left. So I think, you know, what talking to some of the lenders that I know, et cetera, there's not a lot of distress in the office market. Um, and it also appears that a lot of businesses have figured out, you know, remote working and sort of how to, you know, either they're cutting some costs, even though their revenues might be down, they're cutting some costs as well. So they're staying pretty close to their um, income budget. So, um, you know, I'm hopeful that that will continue, you know, between the t now and the time we get a vaccine and people get back to work. But as far as occupancy, Rick, um, in the office towers, the lowest occupancy are in urban areas in the office towers, which, you know, could be anywhere from two to like six or seven percent. There's really not those those buildings have the fewest people. Um, and I think it's a couple of reasons. I think one public transportation is the primary mode of transportation to get people in, which is a concern for some people. Um, I think the second thing, and it has not turned out to be an issue, but I think a lot of people thought if you're only going to allow two or three people in an elevator, you know, it might take me 30 minutes in the lobby to get up to my um, space, but that has not been an issue at all because I, I hear from a lot of people, a lot of times they have their own private elevator, you know, many, many times. So, uh, and then the other, the other thing, I think a lot of businesses, as I mentioned, have sort of figured out to be able to keep their efficiency up for the time being, um, you know, so they're out of the most, um, you know, safety precaution, keeping people at home. Um, the suburbs, uh, Rick, you know, I'm seeing somewhere in the range of, depending on, you know, the, the, the building and the tenancy, anywhere from 10 to 50% occupancy. So, and I think there's two reasons for that. One is you drive in the suburbs, so you sort of have control over your own personal space to get, you know, into the office, so you don't have that concern or risk. Um, and then you're also, you know, not, I think a lot of businesses that have employees coming out on the train have the concern of someone may, may catch COVID on the train and then bring it into the office. So uh, just that control factor. The, the second thing is I think in suburban buildings, for the most part, people aren't you know eight or 10 per thousand square feet uh, like they are in an urban environment. So it's a little bit easier for those companies to spread out. Maybe pe more people have private offices. I'm not exactly sure um, on, on that regard. But, and then the final thing is the small businesses uh, I'm seeing them, you know, they're coming in every day and the larger companies, you know, are the ones that are telling their employees to stay home. So it's, it's an interesting dichotomy in that regard. I think on the leasing front, you know, uh, it's been described to me uh, for the most part, leasing has been put into hibernation. Um, and the only transactions that are going on are one, if someone has a near term expiration, um, they're trying to do a short term, you know, renewal just to kind of, you know, figure out, all right, one, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to commit too long as I don't know how many people I'm actually going to, you know, how, how much space I need, you know, I may have to continue to have people working from home permanently. Um, and second of all, you know, I think they're also the thought process of, is this the right location for me? You know, are we going to split the office? Do we have an office, you know, in the city? Do we have an office in the suburbs? So there's just a lot of uncertainty from businesses, uh, you know, on their future. So they're doing the short term renewal. The ones that are doing more longer term deals that I've been involved with are typically people that have an expiration and they have some certainty on what their space needs are going to be. And for the most part, unfortunately, they're all downsizing. Um, so that's one thing that, you know, we're sort of seeing where I think um, the CEOs of, that I've talked to have said there's some people that never have to come into the office again. OK, so if it's a role where they're just not in a collaborative type role, if they don't want to come in, you know, they don't have to come in. Um, whereas, you know, if you're an R and D, if you work, you know, in a team environment, et cetera, you know, those folks will probably come back. The, the other, the other one that's interesting, you know, we talked about before lab space, um, you know, is a very hot 
topic, you can't, you know, you just can't do some of that work in your house. You know, you, you, need, you need the equipment um, that's in a lab. So lab space is continuing. What's interesting, a lot of those companies are saying to their employers, the scientists can come in, no one else should come into the office unless they absolutely need to, because, you know, they're working on something that's important. They want to reduce the risk of someone, you know, getting COVID and having to shut the office down. Um, I think, Rick, on the investment sales side, which is interesting, if you have a high quality building with term left and some certainty for somebody and a good credit tenant, um, I'm actually seeing those buildings go for a premium today. Um, and if you have a building with not a lot of term left, uh, multi-tenanted, rollover and uncertainty, uh, I'm not seeing those trade at all. You know, I'm not saying there's not a market for it, but the sellers are typically just saying, I'll hold on until there's more certainty. Um, and you know, then I'll sell it in whatever, a year or two years. So it's an interesting market where there's actually a premium for certain office buildings, um, lab buildings, a premium for, and then other office buildings, we're just not seeing trading. And then the only other thing I think is really interesting on the human behavior scale is, as I mentioned, for businesses, they're trying to kick the can down the road. They're uncertain, they're not making decisions. On a personal level, it's fascinating to me how, you know, people are buying, you know, leaving the city, buying homes. I mean, making really long-term commitments, sometimes in many cases, leaving certain areas, moving to another state. Um, so it's kind of amazing on a personal basis, how people are willing to make a long-term commitment um, of like, you know, just completely uprooting their life and businesses are not willing to do that. So th those are a couple of interesting things that I've sort of noticed over the last, call it six months. Great. Also, John, I know you have um, some different types of developments going on in the Boston area. Um, can you tell us a little bit about those and how they've been impacted by the pandemic? Yeah, sure, sure, Rick. Uh, we're doing a residential condominium building. Um, so the I think a couple, couple factors you know, affected it. One was um, you know, we got shut down for three months. So um, you know, going to a construction site that shut down, you know, every few days is like a super depressing thing. It's <laughs> just like, there's nothing more depressing than a half built building uh, with nothing going on. So anyways, uh, you know, that was one thing when we, once we got restarted, I think the challenges were multiple. Uh, one lumber prices, you know, uh, I don't know if they're still double, but you know, lumber prices at one point had doubled. Uh, because the mills had shut down, there was, this, you know, and then, you know, as we talked about, you know, there's the suburban home builders are going crazy. So there was high demand and limited uh, materials. So materials uh, became a real issue. I, I, you know, for me, fortunately, you know, all my framing was done. I had bought 90% of my lumber. I was, you know, I'm in good shape, but I do know quite a few people that had, you know, problems where they had to go back to their lender and try and figure out, you know, can I increase my construction loan, my costs are going up, et cetera. So that was a big problem for people. I think the second thing is um, everything took longer if you needed, you know, city or town approvals uh, because they may have only been in for a couple of days a week. And so it, you know, it took us uh, 90 days to get a street cut permit, which should have taken like two weeks. Uh, but one, they were backed up, you know, so you had 90 days of no one doing any work and it all got backed up. And then two, they were only in a couple of days a week. Um, uh, what do you call it? Appliances. Okay. Getting a refrigerator, very challenging. I, I still actually don't, I'm supposed to get my refrigerators tomorrow. So hopefully they'll come in tomorrow, but just kind of interesting in that one. Um, and then labor, labor was a big deal too. Um, I, I'm going to say only about 80% of the, um, of the plumbers, electricians, et cetera, came back. A lot of them just continue to collect their unemployment um, rather than come back. So that was another challenge. We're kind of slowed down. Once, once we did get back to work, um, each subcontractor was spread a little thinner. Okay, very informative, thanks. Okay, <laughs> sure. we're gonna move on to Carla now. Um, Carla, um, so during this pandemic, what type of legal work um, kept you the busiest? Was it restructurings of debt or leases or just your normal acquisitions and financing, what's kept you the most busy? Thank you so much, Rick, and thank you, Gabe, um, as well. I'm happy to be joined by much more interesting panelists than a boring old lawyer. Um, but I will say that um, it's been a little bit of triage still um, in doing everything. Um, it, every day I have like what a lot of us have in any of us, our careers, the list of things to do, which completely goes sideways by the time I'm about an hour into the day. 
um, because of the emails and, and whatnot. Um, so I am doing a fair amount of lease restructuring. I don't disagree with John. I don't, I, I don't have a great deal of brand new leases coming on. It's lease restructuring, subleasing, assignments of leases, some amended and restated leases that are going sideways. Um, so th that type of thing, it's actually in a, in a weird way. I'm such a nerd about this stuff, but I find it actually really interesting because it really requires creativity to think about it rather than just go, no offense to, you know, broker gives me a term sheet and I go from there and I go to a lease form and I fill it in. And I might talk about some like, you know, um, very, very specialized things between the parties, but then I send it off. Um, this requires a lot more thinking, you know, how are we going to fix it? How are we going to get to a, a solution to the problem of the day? Um, so I, I really enjoy that. Um, in terms of debt restructuring, same thing. Um, that what's interesting about that is COVID came, as all of us know, at the time when the interest rates were at their lowest. And it was just sort of like a perfect storm um, as that was happening, because all of a sudden you had borrowers that couldn't make rent payments, but in any, I'm sorry, that couldn't make their debt payments. But in any other world, they would have been probably restructuring. But now they're like having to justify that on an underwriting standpoint. It really just put them in a really weird spin. And then you had loan originators that are like, well, I have the easy one here, and then I have the trouble loans. So just, I think it was just kind of getting through all of that and helping people see their way um, through that morass of volume. Um, but still to this day, I mean, those of us that know if you're trying to get an acquisition done or a debt restructuring done or, um, you know, refis done, the appraisers are flat out. And, and not, no offense if there's any appraisers on this, um, you know, in the audience, but um, the quality level has gone down um, as a general basis I've seen. Um, they're rushing it. They're missing things. Um, and it's, it's definitely affecting um, some of the appraised numbers that are coming in. And it's making it difficult to get the deals done in a timely manner. Um, in terms of acquisition work, um, similarly, it's, it's lower. There's definitely some cherry picking going on. The, um, there's certainly on the hospitality, you know, restaurant side, you know, that's, um, there's, there's lower volume of that happening. Um, there are the occasional one-offs. And I think it just comes back to in this day and time, if you can hit the right number, I say number, you could do that at any given time, but it may persuade someone to sell whether they when they wouldn't. One of the things that John was talking about was lab space. So as an example, the the owner had no desire to sell this space. It was in Connecticut. This just happened recently. Um, my guy um, is an automated lab, you know, R and D space. He needed it. He's been leasing it this whole time. Wasn't happy with his current space. Really wanted to buy now because the debt is so low. It took us nine months to get that deal done. Three of it was persuading a seller who was an unwilling seller that he really wanted to sell for the right price, which of course we overpaid for. And then having to get an appraiser to come in even close um, and having to explain the whole time to the buyer, I just don't understand why this isn't easier. <laughs> like, oh my God, you're doing it in this time period. So those types of things, um, again, required a lot of creativity, a lot of handholding of all the parties and just patience, um, which is at the absolute lowest mark that I've ever seen in my time of working for 25 years, there's no patience. Whereas before people could, with a little joke or a sense of humor, like you could get past things, um, trigger words are happening so much more in deals. And um, that's, again, it's like I'm almost like psychoanalyzing deals um, as I'm going into them, trying to help people through them. Mm -hmm. um, the final thing was on the permitting, um, you know, to, to, I think it was another point of John's, or maybe David, but, um, a lot of it's happening remotely. Um, and just as I was on this call, I just got a call from a poor tenant who's trying to move short-term um, space into new space. He has to absolutely be out. He should have been out two months ago, but held over. And they can't get a CO because the town hall just closed down because somebody has COVID. Um, and we need to be out this weekend. And so it's like, okay, yay. <laughs> How are we going to solve this one? Um, so there's a lot of that. And how about communication? You know, I know a big part of law firms is communicating with other lawyers and lenders and tenants. Uh, have you found it hard to get communications done during the pandemic? I'm actually going to be really positive on this one. Um, once you find the person, um, and that might be the hardest part because they're not in their office necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, everyone has my phone numbers and I, they have all four of them. <laughs> um, and I swear to God, they must have sent them out to everybody else. Um, but similarly, people have been really great. I have clients, opposing counsel, consultants that I have not met in years knowing them. And I'm being serious, like never met them in person and certainly never met them virtually. 
I will say that within two months of the pandemic and the shutdown of our offices, by May, I had met almost all of them because everyone immediately it went to Zoom or GoMeet or um, uh, Teams from Microsoft, whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. And that was just pretty awesome. I don't know. I, I, if there could be any positives out of it, the fact that I actually feel closer to some of my clients and, you know, the, you know like I said, opposing counsel, other, other folks that are on the, the transaction, it's been pretty nice. Great. All right. Thank you. All right. So now we're going to change up the motif flow. I'm just going to ask some questions of the whole panel. And people can just uh, chime in when they is appropriate. So the first question is, uh, what do you all think the holiday season is going to look like this year? Probably mainly in terms of retail, but also, you know, restaurants, still people going to work or traveling or whatnot. What's everyone's view? It's going to be down. I mean, we know that. I think a lot of the retail sales are probably going to shift online. I do think there is a still a lot of pent up demand. I think people do, you know, will want to go out and shop and they will want to go out and, and eat and they're going to try. Um, I really think they're going to try, but it's, it's going to be difficult. And I think this holiday season, um, sales are going to shift, but I, I would be surprised if the overall volume is down. It's just going to, it won't be in brick and mortar this year. It's a lot of it's going to move online. That's my sense. Hopefully it comes back to brick and mortar, you know, the following hol uh, holiday season, but it's going to be tough. But I think on the same note, uh, many of those tenants that are in like Josh's shopping centers and ours have switched to kind of the omni channel. So they have both, you know, the ability to do online sales as well as, you know, a lot of them are doing this uh, BOPIS, which is like pick, you know, buy online, but pick up at the store so that it gives them a reason to kind of get out of their house and maybe they can hit a restaurant or whatever it might be. But, it, you know, you're not cooped up as much as you were, you know, during the last six months. I think, unfortunately, for those of us who live in the northern part of the country, we're going to have, I think, a more difficult time with the weather elements, keeping people kind of pent in versus, you know, some of the southern states. And I think you're starting to see, you know, a lot of companies and individuals kind of move locations and will that have an impact on you know what the ultimate commerce that gets done in florida let's say versus new york and you know can they handle it um i think it'll be an interesting time but i think the the good news is as we've seen in six months there's been a pretty sharp recovery from what was a pretty horrible period in retail now the question will be you know can we sustain it kind of going into 2021. And if you look around the globe, you know, other countries that have come out earlier and have kind of controlled it a little better have been able to show their pickup in velocity as far as sales and profitability. So I think there's there should be kind of the, the end of the rainbow, kind of the pot of gold someday, but it might be six, 12 or 18 months out. And I think we just have to be patient to get there. This isn't going to shut us down forever, but it's something that, you know, we're going to have to kind of prepare for and be flexible with our tenants to help them get from kind of point A to point B. I think on a positive note too, um, you know, we all, I think everyone likes going to shopping centers and malls during the holiday season. Um, but this year, as you said, I think the seals might be the same. They'll just be even more online seals. So the health of the tenants should be well or better, even though it's not from, as you know, brick and mortar seals. So hopefully that'll help uh, some people, quote unquote, weather the, weather the storm. And I do I also think that, you know, like I said before, I think, you know, if, if the holiday season rolled around, you know, the second or third month into the pandemic, it probably would have been much worse. I think we're now, six, seven months, eight months in, people are tired. You know, they're tired of it. They, they really want to go out. They want some sense of normalcy. I think people are going to fight really hard this holiday season to, to get out and try to, you know, do what they want to do um, despite the pandemic. I think people are going to try to shop if they can and people are going to try to make it as normal as they can. I don't think people are going to brush it off as quickly. Carla, you were about to say something? No, all I was going to say was that um, 
to that point in terms of desire to be there, it was interesting. I don't know if any of you have um, contacts at Simon Mall in Burlington. I happened to be there last weekend. And it is like under construction everywhere. Like literally like, like shut. I mean, I was like, why even try? Like it was, it was, it, it actually made me really disappointed because it was one of the first times I've been inside a mall since the pandemic. And I was all excited about it and then getting excited about the holiday season and then to have that response. So I don't mean to be negative on that property. I'm just saying it happened to be theirs. Um, but I do think that, that, that you, to Josh's point, it is pent up and people do want to do that. And everybody who had masks on, I was all perfectly safe and I felt very comfortable, but I wanted to stay there longer, but it just felt like I, I wasn't invited anymore. So. I think that was just bad times because they've been redeveloping that mall for a while now. So I think it's just got caught in, in between there. Got it. Yeah, Rick, Rick uh, kind of a segue off of the retail sales is really the industrial or e-commerce kind of distribution pipeline. And I can tell you, you know, industrial has been, you know, booming across the country, even, you know, as the economy was doing well before we went into this pandemic, it's gotten even stronger. But I think one of the challenges we're going to find is, you know, delivery, how quickly can you really get the goods? And then also the whole supply chain is really starting to, in certain products, kind of get delayed and dragged out, whether, you know, goods are coming from overseas and getting through the port to where we ultimately need them distributed. So, you know, the people who are kind of waiting to the last to say, hey, I'm going to buy my goods at the last minute and then have them delivered before the holiday may be in for a little bit of a shock that, you know, not everything is necessarily in stock and will it be delivered on time this year mm -hmm. um before we ask our next question um gabe do you want to put out one of our poll questions sure to the audience let's see what comes up here all right you should be able to see that on screen right now okay I was trying to vote and then a little thing came up and said, I can't vote. <laughs> what was I? Dave, you're so mean to us. <laughs> All right, that's poll number one. How about poll number two? All right, so I'm gonna end this poll and you should be able to see the results. It looks like working fully remotely uh, got the most votes. Uh, so we'll move on to this okay. next poll. Someone's having company. Okay, why well, don't we tabulate that one? All right, so we'll stop polling and it looks like industrial buildings uh, got the majority here. Okay. And you can all see the results on screen, is that right? Um, I don't see them actually, I don't know if other people can. Here we go. Oh, here we go. Goes. All right, so this is what the results look like. Okay. Great, okay. And do you want to launch the next poll? Um, sure. So this ties into our, our uh, most recent point about holiday season. Mm -hmm. All right, we'll close polling and I'll share these results. So probably no surprises there. Yeah, it's a pretty lot of people though on buying them online totally. Uh, and then we had one last poll question, uh, okay. but we can hang on to that, Rick, if you- Yeah, we'll only answer that one for a couple minutes. Okay. So the next question All to right. the panelists will be, um, has the pandemic opened up any acquisition opportunities um, in today's marketplace that any of you folks have seen? I'll take a shot at that. What we've seen is, you know, we've talked about retail and the bankruptcies that have come out of that. We've actually been able to buy big box, empty retail properties and convert them to other uses. So for example, we took a Macy's box that we had in Redmond, Washington and converted it into a uh, office space for Amazon, not a retail space. 
Um, we took a old BJ's box in the Carolinas and have now converted it into a lab space. And we have, you know, a lot of demand being around the research triangle. And so I think the, you know, there's always for good properties that are well located, this has kind of accelerated some opportunity to kind of re to get the property. Now it doesn't help necessarily on the development side, but from a distress standpoint, as I think John had said earlier, there hasn't been a lot of distress in the debt markets to really show, you know, foreclosures across all product types, but the servicers have clearly started to take, you know, a lot of properties back into, you know, master servicing and under review. And I think, you know, in 2021, I think you're going to start to see a lot of those kind of come out, especially in the areas like hospitality, probably leading the pack as far as, you know, properties that might be available for, you know, kind of turnaround situations. Uh, Rick, the thing I would comment on, for, you know, for me, I'm more of a value add. So um, it just the uncertainty of what the future holds makes it just a little difficult for me to underwrite, you know, what I, what I think I'm going to get for returns. I just don't know when people are going to, you know, come back to the space and start leasing again. But that being said, well, you know, there's plenty of, there's a lot of listings. Well, we've been on this call. I got, you know, four offerings and today I've gotten like 13 or 14 so far. So, you know, definitely seeing a lot of product come to market. Uh, and I think um, someone, someone asked a question in the Q and A, one of the things uh, the question was, you're looking at different markets based on the pandemic. So the one comment I was going to make to you is, you know, I, I do have a serious concern about the expensive cities, you know, the Boston's, the New York's, the San Francisco's, for example, um, where a lot of these employers have figured out, you know, hey, my employees are doing pretty well working from Salt Lake City or Boise, Idaho or wherever, um, you know, so maybe I just keep my core here and I start opening offices in other places. So, so one of the things that, you know, my goal for 2021, Rick, is to really look at some of the southern cities um, you know, where they have a lower cost, you know, still have good transportation. Um, to me, a, a big issue in, the, in these expensive Northeast cities, the cost of housing, you know, cost of housing is a real detriment. Um, and if you look at like the U-Haul index, which I, I look at sort of every year, um, you know, a place like Massachusetts is typically 47th with people moving in. And like Florida and Texas have been like one and two in the last three or four years. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, there's definitely, there was that pattern even before COVID. So I also think you, you know, you really have to kind of, as an investor, you have to look at some of these other markets, um, that may outperform the, you know, the expensive cities over the next four or five years. And Sandy, what have you seen in the multifamily, either for stabilized or distress, are there deals getting done? Is, I wouldn't say there's a lot of distress right now in the multifamily. Like we expected there to be some. Um, but right before this, we had a developer's call um, internal and, and we're talking about the fact that yields on, on ground up um, deals have gotten worse, meaning like they've gotten um, more aggressive. Um, they haven't gotten better. We expected numbers to, to be better, but again, low interest rates, low cap rates are, are dry, continue to drive yields down. Um, there were some early deals that we chased um, early in the pandemic that came out expecting them to um, have some amount of distress if they were coming up, coming to market early in April um, and May. And those numbers, those deals um, went under contract at kind of um, uh, nosebleed prices, right? So kind of setting the bar, very well located deals too with lots and lots of interest. Um, so the, for the best located deals to, to John's point um, and David's point, uh, there, there's a lot of interest and, and a lot of competition that's driving pricing up. On, on the flip side, um, we, we're starting to see, I've seen a couple, two to three hotel opportunities come across my desk that are well located that could be converted to, to housing. Um, that's not a slam dunk in, in the Boston area due to the zoning requirements um, and, you know, kind of what in the entitlement process would be for multifamily, but it certainly is something that, you know, people always talk about that the ability to reposition. Um, and we expected that earlier in the pandemic. And I think it's just starting to come to fruition now. Um, and, then, and then the last piece that I'll, I'll note is 
um, we're definitely finding that uh, deals are, um, there's much more of an appetite for, for the suburbs, right? Um, we, we went to market to get equity on a deal that we're gonna start construction on next year in a close in suburb, but very suburban garden style product. And we had a lot of interest, a lot of talk, got a couple of term sheets, um, not quite as many term sheets as we thought we might given the interest, there's a lot of tire kicking out there. Um, but, but again, we're not, we're not seeing the distress, at least not now, that we'd expected. Um, and the, I guess the last comment I'll add is, you know, the big talk on the multifamily side is what's gonna happen to construction prices. Once the noise in the lumber market shakes out, um, it, are we really gonna start seeing uh, decreased construction pricing kind of for some short period of time where the stars align and there's not enough pipeline um, that people are chasing, and so they're willing to write down a bit on the uh, construction costs. So anecdotally, we've heard a lot of people talking about that, but in actuality, I've only heard of it on one deal. Okay. All right, Gabe, why don't we ask the last poll question, then I'll ask one more question, and I think we're going to call it a day. Um, although I will say, I uh, just want to let well, Gabe ask your poll. Okay, let's tabulate. Well, I'm surprised a lot of people still eat in, indoors, but that's good, I guess. Um, and the last thing I would say is, um, so this is a great um, webinar we put together. Also, um, for people who are on webinar, if you want to listen for, um, in about a, next month sometime, I think the middle of the month, we have a lot of uh, BU alumni who own restaurants uh, throughout New England and the East Coast. Um, and as we all know, they're going through a lot of turbulence. So we're thinking about putting together a webinar uh, to hear from uh, some actual restaurant operators. So that should be interesting, but we'll let everybody know when that happens. Um, but the last question for this webinar, um, when does everybody foresee a full return to normalcy um, both in retail and in the commercial real estate market in general. Step right up. I think for us in retail, I'd say early, early 22, Q1 22. I was gonna say end of 21, early 22. I mean, we, we think it's vaccine driven, but it's, it's beyond that. It takes, it's gonna take time on the multifamily side for people to kind of come back to their real life um, and for offices to be opened back up, people not to be camping out in their parents' basement. Um, you know, a lot of the, the, um, a lot of the resident prospects are people right out of school and they're not, they're not in apartments, they're at home with their parents for the most part. Rick, I, I would say this, it, it started off as flat in the curve and I thought we were gonna be closed for four to six weeks. And uh, you know it's still going, so I'm not even gonna I'm not even gonna venture a guess. Honestly, it's just like it's it's too unpredictable for me to to venture a guess. Yes, I, I would I would agree that it's it's hard to pick a day, but it's going to be longer than we all anticipate, as we've already seen, and therefore we just gotta. I, I think a lot of it has to do with kind of the psychology of convincing people that, you know, whether it's the fear factor or getting employers to kind of mandate that, you know, you're going to come back to work because at some point we got to kind of come out of our shells and take on what's around us. We're not trying to rush it. You know, we have to be smart about it. But until that day happens, whether that's tomorrow or a year from now or, you know, two years from now, I think until that's required for employers to say, hey, there's an alternative, come back to work it's going to continue to get dragged out. Kyla, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I'm a little bit more positive. I actually think by this time next year, um, I mean, as I said, as a lawyer doing real estate, the, the volume of, of stuff hasn't changed. It's just the type of transactions that I'm working on. So I feel like there's almost to, to the point earlier about going to retail and going shopping and 
not wanting to be pent up in your house. It's just the same with folks like you that are all in commercial development, commercial transactions. There's like this pent up, I want to get back to business. And I think that people are going to start from a deal structuring standpoint, certainly getting ready to do all of that in the third and fourth quarter um, with a very serious nature and starting to take advantage of deals that they see coming on. And honestly, what I'm waiting for are the bankruptcies um, in the first and second quarter of next year. I'm sorry, I'm, I did a downer. That was a horrible okay. way to end. No, I'm also <laughs> positive. I think that the game changer is going to be the vaccine. And if it really can be distributed in, say, April of next year, plus or minus, I think things are going to ramp up pretty quickly from that point on. But I think it all depends on when the vaccine gets officially released, uh, how it gets distributed, and if people aren't having problems from it. I think if that's the case, we can bounce back pretty quickly. So but I guess it's all to be determined. Um, but thanks, everybody, for your input. I think Gabe's going to take over now and give us a little closing scenario. Yeah, uh, that was great. Many thanks to John, David, Carla, Sandy, and Josh for your wonderful insights this afternoon, and to Rick for guiding us through this discussion. Uh, we'd also like to thank you for joining us today. And as always, a special thanks to our donors for supporting BU and programs like this. Uh, before I let you go, I wanna make sure that you know about BU Connects, uh, the Alumni Association's newest platform exclusively for BU alumni, students, faculty, and staff that brings Terriers together for networking on a global scale. Uh, the platform offers a networking directory, a place for jobs and internships, mentoring, uh, and most importantly, groups for industry and affinity networking, including a real estate network. Uh, so you can bo uh, join both BU Connects and the real estate network on BU Connects at buconnects.com. And it only takes about a minute to set up your, uh, your profile. So I'll send more details uh, about that uh, to you shortly in a follow-up message. And as always, you can find all of our upcoming programs on the alumni events calendar at bu.edu backslash alumni backslash events. Thanks again for joining us today. Have a happy and safe Thanksgiving, and we look forward to seeing you all at a future BU event. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Bye, everybody. Take care. Thanks.